So I'm going to use the example of land use and river restoration. Um, sorry, I'm going to talk about land use and river restoration using the case study of the Lower River Y. Um, this is a, a picture of the river from Simmons Yap. Um, it demonstrates the beautiful landscape of um, the English part of the river. The, the Lower River Y uh, flows through Wales and then England. And it's a transboundary river because of that. Um, and the regulatory bodies are Natural England, the Environment Agency, and Natural Resources Wales. The, the River Y is designated as the triple SI because of uh, the river habitat types and the internationally and nationally important species such as salmon, shad, lamprey, bullhead. Um, those are also um, the reasons for the SAC uh, status as well. The, the River Y forms a, a large part of the, an area of outstanding natural beauty, which hopefully you can, you can see from this photograph, which also demonstrates some of the land uses in the, in the catchment. So the driver behind our investigation uh, was unfavourable recovering status of six of the seven management units of the SSSI. Our investigation looked at the background, the geomorphology and the ecological status of the river, and that went into the technical report. This, uh, we drew on those findings and um, we developed a restoration vision and strategy on a reach-by-reach -reach basis for the River Y. And accompanying the management report and the technical report was an interactive map which we used ArcGIS for and is a tool which I believe the regulators and managers of the river can use to explore the different pressures at a site scale. We're currently at draft stage and uh, the company I work for, Jacobs, have been um, employed to or commissioned to take this through to consultation over the upcoming months. So our investigation drew on previous studies, such as Natural England's condition assessment, the landscape character areas, um, that has a lot of um, information on ecosystem services, Alcro, Halcro's 2012 fluvial audit, and the Environment Agency's RHS River Habitat Survey data uh, from 1995 to 2008, and we reported that into ArcGIS. We took the aerial imagery and looked at the different functions um, from the forms that we observed. So you can see a point bar. And we also explored the land use pressures in the catchment from that um, absence or narrow buffer strips. And also channel modifications. In this you can see in the bottom right hand, left hand corner, the croys. Um, they, they're like deflectors which the fishermen use, um, which create shallower areas behind them. And we've got really uh, bridge structure from the railway that has been dismantled. Then we had limited funding, so we uh, targeted our fieldwork to specific sites and, um, throughout the catchment, at looking at areas that were potential sites for restoration. So we used that to corroborate our findings. So. What did we find for land use? Well, we found that it was a predominantly rural area. And these, these figures are taken from the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology um, website, which is available to all. The bottom left-hand uh, photograph, no, sorry, right-hand photograph. I did practice this before, and I got them right, but... <laughs> is uh, an example of the, one of the, the dramatic landscape through this catchment. It, the river deep, is deeply incised through the, limes, the limestone plateau and the resultant wooded, uh, steep wooded slopes, uh, resort cliffs. And the, the urban picture is, well, one of the few towns along the river uh, which is you know, picturesque uh, and hopefully you can, you can see that people are enjoying um, the river for its boating and canoeing activities. I also explored by the ecosystem services, as I mentioned before, 
and you can see a sample of those, although it's not a comprehensive list. The genetic diversity refers to the traditional or orchards and the fruit, fruit orchards and the Hereford cattle, which um, is like red and white cows. And the, the sense of tranquility is intrinsic to the rural uh, landscape, which many people enjoy um, by walking. There's a lot of walkers in this area. And the River Y Valley Walk is, is very popular. So the key issues identified for the um, unfavourable recovering condition. The, one of the main ones is uh, sedimentation uh, through soil erosion. You've got arable fields that are left bare during uh, winter months. I have to say that the, um, the right-hand picture, picture is actually a rare site along the catchment. I saw a lot of good practice. Um, the red colour is as a result of the underlying geology of the area. It's old red land, uh, sandstone. Um, you've also got intensive ag um, agriculture as well, leading to soil, soil compaction, increasing runoff. So. In conjunction with this, uh, you've got the prevalence of invasive species, Himalayan balsam, which is a very big problem because during the summer months it grows out and competes aggressively with other native plants and then in the winter months dies back, leaving the banks exposed and vulnerable to erosion. erosion. Also through our investigation, we explored uh, Brooks's 1983 um, investigation of uh, capital works and pioneer tree clearance through the 1930s and 80s. Um, this river, the Y is on the right hand side. And you can see that actually it's extensive pioneer tree clearance, but the capital works are, are fairly limited. So it's largely unmodified on a, a, a large scale. You can see that without the tree cover and vegetation stability, you, you can get quite severe erosion. Well, again, this is just one location of the Y catchment that actually is quite active. And then unusually, instead of cattle and sheep uh, poaching, you've also got canoeists. This is a very popular area for people to use. And then we've got channel modifications. You can see that Croy's engineered bank profiles and setback embankments are a key, the three main pressures. The Croy's are the fishing platforms, which you can see um, in the left hand uh, picture, the fishermen uh, standing in front or behind it, and they're made of stone and concrete, and there's a lot of them, and there's a problem with removal because there's a historic agreement with landowners and the environment agency to protect them, but they're not allowed to put any new ones in. And then there's a few locations of set, um, embankments, Hampton Bishop is the top picture. You might notice from the bar graph that there actually is no barriers along the low river, the lower river Y. All of the Ys, uh, sorry, all of the weirs have been removed, and that's dating right back to 1662, the Y Navigation Act, where they started to be removed uh, to allow for navigation. So my investigation, or Jacob's investigation, also looked at other issues, not just land use, and I thought it would be useful to have. Um, to seek the understanding of the river and its needs for restoration from the public. So I've just got some a video to, to watch. How do you interact with the River Y? Is that loud enough? The River Y. Walking alongside it. Yeah? Yeah, same. It's just nice to have it there, I suppose, really. Uh, I don't swim, I certainly don't <laughs> boat, so I'm not an angler or anything like that, but uh, it's a fantastic uh, area, scenically, and particularly if you go upstream. I've been walking around the River Wye today, uh, down at Simmons Yard, uh, and we've had a good day, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I've seen wildlife in it and yeah. enjoyed it, and decided to relax to go for canoeing. I can see it from my room and uh, from most of my rooms and yeah. so I watch quite a bit of rowing and uh, the swans and the ducks and all the wildlife. Yeah. So it's really nice to see it all the time and to hear it. We've been canoeing a couple of times. Yeah. Throwing stones in it. <laughs> We've only been here once mm. and this is the first time using it for the regattas. If I told you the river needed to be restored, how would you react? Yeah, that's a good idea. Well, yes, definitely. I think it should be done if it needs to be done.
Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, one of the things like the Himalayan balsam growing along the banks in many places, so yeah. um, and, uh, that could do with uh, being eradicated. Um, and, uh, I imagine there's a fair amount of runoff of uh, fertilizer and that sort of thing from the uh, farm line, so it, you know, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. I don't think so, I think it's nice as it is in its natural form. Yeah. Okay. I suppose it depends on the amount of storm. It's not pollution in it, or whether you're talking about putting it back to how it was used originally, which of course would have been quite industrial actually. Yeah. I don't like the um, concrete pieces where the boats come in. I think they're very ugly. Yeah. What do you mean restore? Take all the shopping trucks out? It doesn't really need any further works to improve it as it is. Um, from a rowing perspective, we'd like uh, more water in the river at times. Um, and we'd like to see some, uh, a bit of improvement to our facilities. Well, it's quite clean. Yeah, it's really clean. Yeah, I find it a bit shallow. What do you think could be done to improve or restore the river? It just seems a bit unkempt oh, at okay. the moment. Yes, yes. And just if it was tidied up, it could just be stunning. Uh, making sure that uh, not too much bank erosion uh, takes place. Uh, uh, although it doesn't seem that bad compared with some streams I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think just people becoming, local people are becoming more aware of it as well as a community. If they start to use it themselves with a little bit luck, they might start to care about it a bit more. Possibly things like water bottle habitat. Yeah. But I don't really know if there's any in there that therefore yeah. there's always a lack of them that needs restoring. We're aware of that issue because we live in the Cotswolds. And they've been doing quite a lot of work to restore waterfall habitat. Okay. Um, but no, I wouldn't have said I'd really yeah. noticed. No, okay. Cut some of the trees back, I think, on probably both sides, but mainly in the centre part, just here. discussion points for later on, maybe some just, you know, misconceptions. Okay. <laughs> so, just a few restoration op and opportunities that we identified through a restoration uh, plan, our management report. So, working with the farming community, identifying appropriate stocking regimes so that you limit the intensification of grazing, um, reducing soil compaction or poaching, Identifying appropriate cultivation measures across the slope, uh, conservation rather than direct uh, pathways down to the river. Uh, riparian zone restoration, so you're developing semi or natural grasslands along the river to intercept and prevent sediment entering the river. These are some examples of perhaps uh, creating small wetlands at the end of drainage channels. Channel restoration and rehabilitation. Removal of croys, reduce and seize channel maintenance, reprofile sec resection banks, breach embankments where it doesn't conflict with any flood management policies, reduce gravel removal, and remove bank protection. These are some examples of visualizations we provide in the management report, which we'll take through to consultation. We find they're very useful for the you know, engaging members of the public. So you've got the present day with the bank protection, removal of that. And then in perhaps five to ten years, you've got more erosion on the outside of the Beyond Bend, but then also you've developed, allowed vegetation to develop in the diversity of it. Maintaining ecological flows, managing the abstraction, there's a uh, dam on one of the subcaptions, and also you've just got abstraction licenses. Control invasive non native species. Incorporate sustainable urban drainage systems into new developments. So then our final two slides just look at uh, the delivery and funding mechanisms that are available. So over the next few months, we'll be engaging with the various stakeholders, which are on the slide, uh, to come up with a 
a consensus of, of a strategy uh, approach to um, to the river restoration, and uh, the NFU stands for National Farmers Union, and then a combination of funding and guidance measures will be um, the collection of uh, those that are on the slide. So you can see is the Agri Environmental Scheme, a uh, new Environmental Land Management Scheme, uh, European Fisheries Fund. So I hope that you know all the rest. And thank you. That's it. So this picture uh, sums up the situation of rivers in whole Europe, I think. We have, uh, this is the river Adige, it's the most important river in South Rio, as it uh, drains 98% of the surface, of the surface, of South Rio, sorry. <laughs> and um, the height, the pressures of the anthropogenic, uh, the anthropogenic pressures are quite high in the and the volley buttons, as you, can, as you can see and as you know. And um, Victor Schauberger was an Austrian uh, forest ranger. Uh, that's why I left it in German, as it is uh, the original language, but I tried to translate it, because I think it's a citation from 100 years ago, but it's uh, really interesting. Just imagine what would happen if we would stretch the blood vessels following the hydraulic regulation prescriptions. Life would end in a moment. And I think this is the situation that we are facing now. So we have a really strong alteration of the river corridors landscape in the last 200 years. If you look at the, this picture, this is again the Adige. It's uh, south of Merano and we see that in 1820 it was uh, the whole valley bottom was covered by repairing area and the riverbed was braided. And the situation that we're facing now is quite different. Now we have uh, just a really straightened um, river. We and all the part, all the surface that has been um, riparian forest before is now are now apple orchards, or as we can see here in this area, this uh, um, is now industrial area, and before it was riparian. So and if we look at, at the numbers, it's also quite impressive. The riverbed has been reduced by 63% and the uh, repairing area even more, it uh, has been reduced by 83%. And I think it's a quite alarming situation that we have uh, not only in, in Thalschul, and it's especially alarming when we think that 90% of the endangered species in Thalschul live in wetlands. So that's why they are endangered, <laughs> because of the loss of habitats. So I think it's clear that we have to act, and that's why we developed this uh, development plan. In, uh, we have now first edition, here you see on the, uh, where, where South Rio is situation, situated. It's in the middle of the Alps, it's in the north of Italy. The main objective of our development plan, and we see here the the f uh, shape of South Rio is just uh, all the rivers that we have in South Rio and that are forming the shape of the land. And uh, the main objective is to coordinate the river restoration initiatives in our department, as we work in the Department of Hydraulic Engineering, in order to achieve a good water status at this, as it is asked from the Water Framework Directive. So we are working with some principles. We want to consider the streams as interconnected systems, not only looking at the riverbed, but looking also at the adjacent uh, floodplain areas. We want to reflect carefully and uh, act, and it's uh, really important as our uh, department has its own uh, construction company, it's really important that it's really pragmatic and uh, applicable, this uh, development plan. And we want to uh, use public areas first. As you can imagine, uh, uh, river restoration sometimes it seems to you to be in front of a big wall, like in, the, in this picture. And it's, uh, I think the challenge is to look behind this wall. And this wall in this picture is a check dam that uh, was on the uh, Rio Mareta that has been restored and uh, it has been removed. 
So the methodology that we are working with, um, we tried to get all the available data that already have been uh, elaborated to and to put them together in this database that were data about uh, river engineering works uh, on the rivers in Sassuolo, then the passage of fish and sediments, then the morphological status and so on. And on this then we organized workshops with experts. This uh, was really important to put the knowledge and the experience that a lot of people already have together with the facts and then on the GIS database we discussed what could be practical restoration measures for Sastrial. The first step was that we divided Sastrial in fluvial systems. Um, the fluvial systems are more or less homogeneous natural areas uh, that we divided um, in, um, regarding the um, inclination of the rivers, vegetation zone, life zone and so on. And uh, we had 19 fluvial systems then and then uh, we distinguished between mountainous um, fluvial systems and the uh, fluvial systems in the valley bottoms and then we elaborated measure catalogs for the valley bottoms that we can see here. This are the nine areas for which we had catalogs of measures. And now let's have a look into the development plan. This is an overview uh, map of the fluvial system of Paso Adige, where we've seen before the photos. And we have for every measure a uh, codex to recognize and to find it then in the measure catalog. And uh, we divide the measures in different categories. And uh, we want to act where possible. And uh, so we have different uh, sizes also of measures, like really punctual measures for the fish passage to restore the river continuum. Then measures on a small scale for, for example, like structural uh, improvement, but always uh, inside of the uh, riverbed. And then where it is possible and where we have the uh, public land on large scale river widening. And uh, if we have a look even more inside, and one, uh, this is one um, page of the catalog of the um, development plan, we have measures, we, we give a rough description of the, where it is uh, located and uh, have a map, and then we describe roughly the status quo, the objective, the measure, uh, the estimated costs and the problems that we are uh, expecting and then uh, um, on, on this example that we see here we already um, started it and now my colleague Peter will uh, show you the first application. Yes, here is uh, the river Talbo at uh, Burgiano that uh, confluence uh, it's already disconnected by a check dam and um, the development plan um, indicate the need to restore the, the river and uh, the structural improvements. Here we see the situation before intervention, before uh, the, the river is uh, here is a con the check them and disconnect the river continuum and the river bed is very mono monotone and uh, just uh, the first part of the restoration um, <coughs> is uh, being completed and the river now is uh, in a more, much more better condition and the river continuum is restored uh, and uh, another at uh, value of surplus is uh, now the river can use him also for canyoning and uh, this is uh, very important to uh, give the, the sense of uh, more uh, importance of this work for the people but uh, what's uh, what uh, what our target what uh, what we uh, where we will go with the development plan our vision uh, with the development plan, we uh, like uh, the, uh, she would help us to recognize uh, 
uh, working out the synergies to optimize uh, land use and uh, make sure that flood protections go hand in hand with nature protection. And this is uh, quite uh, difficult and uh, to explain this on an example in South Rural, uh, and we can see the river Areno. Here we see the river Areno on a flow, a normal uh, discharge and I like to pay the attention here on this riparian area and then downstream on this settlement area. And uh, if you look now the situation with the uh, 150 year flood events, you see the riparian area is not uh, uh, is disconnected by the river and uh, the settlement are at risk and so this is quite a distorted situation um, uh, and so the challenge is to uh, convert this, this situation <coughs> and um, optimize the land use, the land use, and uh, to, to, con to convert the situation and find out a win-win situation. Hopefully, that uh, the riparian area is re reconnected with the river, and the settlement is uh, uh, saved for the flood. Area. But this is a high uh, issues, and we have to go uh, step by step. And on this area, we work uh, still on uh, since uh, 2005. <coughs> and uh, in this time, we realized uh, three interventions to improve the structural biodiversity. And uh, always in a strange uh, dialogue with the owners the, from the um, from the areas that agree in the, the river. The line to work. So, as you can see, we have been also able to improve the situation and restore uh, important habitats. And we go, uh, we are still working on it, and we go step by step. <laughs> <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, I will present you some results of our actions along the section of Danube River in, in Slovakia. We realized this mostly from uh, projects supported by financial instrument LIFE. I studied something like a nature conservation in Bratislava, in more understandable language. And in uh, Many of our actions we have realized in the project focusing on endangered species of birds, but of course many other species, including humans, are benefiting from the restored Danube and, and habitats. There is maybe interesting partnership in this project of, of our NGO, State uh, Water Management uh, Enterprise and uh, University in Bratislava. And also we have similar partners in Hungary, so other side of the river, NGO and state water management company. So here is the project side. Green is the left side of the political border, somewhere in the middle of the river. And the red is Hungarian side of the Danube floodplain, but for the nature it's one, one continuous floodplain area. Uh, as this life project usually has uh, the key or the core of the project is focused on uh, restoration of natural habitats and there is also lots of awareness and dissemination uh, actions. So we had some actions on the restoring of large river branches and to reconnect them back back to the Danube River in order to get uh, flowing flowing water and fishes and all what it includes into the side river branches which were cut off to bring the water in some uh, 
former wetlands dried because of human interventions and so on. And that's it. So lowland, lowland meadows are very important habitats concerning biodiversity and actually it's the habitat type which was decreased most significantly because it was turned usually to arable land, sometimes to forests and only, only very little re remnants has remained, especially in inundation zones. So this is how it worked in the past and probably will never work again in larger scale anymore. To be realistic, as no, nobody of us is willing to do this for a very long time, this activity. I don't know what about you, but it's my experience. <laughs> also, this uh, looks uh, very romantic, but uh, somehow people willing to live like that are disappearing now. Also, we like a lot the pictures, but so, but because this, this kind of uh, land use has disappeared, the remnants of the grasslands which is left are looking like this often. They are degraded and uh, overgrown by in invasive species and so on. So we, as one of the actions, we restored the lowland meadows. Of course, it has huge importance for biodiversity of different species, but also also, it, it has big uh, influence in order to keep the inundation zone clear and, and uh, to have the area open to allow faster f f flow of the water during the floods and so on. So, to set up sustainable system of uh, grassland management, this kind of grazing machines have been arranged, as, as you can mm -hmm. see. Which, which can manage grassland very nicely, also in the areas where machine doesn't work very much. So, and uh, we restored about 100 hectares of meadows at Valkilel Island, where we did also <coughs> other river restoration actions along, and really did the former grassland look, look like this at the beginning. But these kind of uh, moving machines are very good in this, and this is how it look, how it looks and how. So with this, once we restore <coughs> the grassland, it can be maintained, and with the species of plants and some insect rapidly, a quick, came back. So we we work part in the area which is influenced by the dam of, of Gabčikovo, which <coughs> changed the water regime but also increased highly excess to the area by this series of lines and access roads. So other land uses had it much easier to change the nature into money and, and forest plantations of hybrid poplars. So we did some actions on planting of native trees to have some mosaic of natural forest habitats for future, even if the, the forest area is quite still quite intensively used, but it can create for future some mosaic for nesting of specific bird species or also for natural spreadings of, uh, of uh, seeds from these trees and natural regeneration. One day, this bird can use like a little old black store, can use uh, trees we have planted now. Uh, to, to make these actions uh, going well in the, in the field, we spend lots of effort on raising awareness of all the institutions involved in all kind of planning and permitting of this, of this uh, restoration actions by by different means trying to make it attractive for people so like informational panels and so on we spent quite some time in a way that somebody will really read the panels so as as less writing as possible and 
to have it in a language for local people. In our case it means Slovak and Hungarian mostly. And we avoided English language as we recognize that basically nobody will read the English text in this area. So then if we do other language version then, then German mostly. As most of the tourists are coming from this, these countries. We, we have arranged two bird watching or wildlife watching heights for the, for the people to enjoy the nature without disturbing. So this is this is how it how it works when it's finished. So it works like this for birds to watch the people. <laughs> Very strange, isn't it? <laughs> That's what birds think about us. Uh, okay. And we, we also from the project we have to produce some kind of brochure, which is an obligation from the life project. We were first of all lazy to write a long brochure and then we said okay well we will write it but actually who will read it? And <laughs> it's very hard to think that many people will read any kind of brochure. We have plenty of them here. So we we are we organized uh, we did a map of the Danube, whole section of the Danube with high quality touristic map which is which is often used. Uh, with some restoration, with some success of restoration actions, we had to to reprint new version of the map as some areas you can see without water have been restored from the project. So we had to uh, print out new edition of the maps in order to be, to be updated. And we did also many kinds of exhibitions, uh, exhibitions, meetings with uh, students when, when election, some, any kind of elections are coming even people like ministers are interested to open the exhibitions and they care about the Danube so much so which is very good. And we organize all kind of meetings and, and trips to the relevant institutions or so other our experience, we try to keep lots of personal contact with relevant uh, authorities, people, and representatives of institutions because all study or expert studies are very important but often not very much read and used. So first we try to get attention of the people to these, these arguments. So these are some example of examples of how to how to show nature to people and children if the stakeholders are very more important they can get some goulash as well but they don't need to walk they can be transported on tractor for example such an attractive way so here we have some directors from Slovak water management enterprise representatives of the European Commission and so on. So, so we try to show them in field what's going on and why. And also we promote all these jobs promoted through media, also National Geographic in Hungary was repeatedly interested in some actions. And this was just a very brief look how to try to bring life back to the common day real. Thank you for your attention. So about, I'm talking about environmentally friendly drainage measures, and especially about the use of two stage profiles to improve diversity and water quality in agricultural streams. And here you can see an example of what what it practically means that this two-stage two profile which has been excavated. The problem in Finnish circumstances where we need drainage in agricultural areas for arable land, lands like you can see in the picture, the problems are that there's the problem for water quality if we dredge the small Brooks normally in a normal way, like in this, like in this picture, 
that there comes nutrient loading from the fields and also suspended solids from the channel itself during flood season especially. There's decreased diversity in the brooks and problems with erosion, sedimentation and overgrowth and also of course change of hydrology downstream and it needs expensive maintenance afterwards. These agricultural brooks have, they have a lot of values in Finnish circumstances. They are important breeding and living environments for many species, even for trouts and other, especially trouts about this migratory fish. And like also even sea migrating, trouts are living in these agricultural brooks and they are really vulnerable in the Baltic Sea region. And, and the, these agricultural brooks, they upgrade landscape diversity in agricultural areas that, that are monotonous and they, are, they serve as ecological corridors for life, life, wildlife also. So what is environmentally friendly drainage? We try to, to con combine the two functions. Agricultural drainage because we are working mm -hmm. on private land so drainage is needed. But we try to improve also the ecological and morphological and hydrological state of the agricultural streams. And in this sense, the main method is the two-stage channel profile. It means that there is a low flow channel. And in the water, when, when, it's, when the channel is narrow, it can be deep enough for fish, for instance and it serves for morpholo morphological diversity in the brook. And the flood terrace itself, it improves the water convenience, so the, the flood water <coughs> can go so that without rising to the fields. And then there might be needed also submerged wares in these in this channels or brooks, maybe sand trucks are needed and sedimentation pools and also constructed wetlands to stop nutrient loading. So this is one example from our brochure about these methods. In the, in the, in the upper picture you can see the normal or traditional drainage system, erosion and so on. There's the drainage pipe also and the, the two-stage profile in the, in the other picture with, the, with narrow flat terraces. And here to the left is the original state. The brook has been, it has began meandering after the, the first drainage or dredging that happened maybe 20, 30 years ago. And now it's causing problems for the fields, so there's, there is a flooding. And to the right you can see what's how it looks like after making this making this two-stage profile excavation for this brook very soon after the excavation, maybe one or two months later. We have here one other case which was studied also in the Aalto University, Ritobekken. Uh, you can see the, the area's catchment is 10 kilometers, 10 square kilometers. It's regarded to be, to be a water course so it's a, a brook area and some parts and downstream they are, it, it belongs to the Natura area and there's also vulnerable stock of, of brown trout. It's really valuable at this area, so it's genuine, original, it's gen genetically tested that it's really genuine and not stocked stock of brown trout. So there were these problems, frequent flooding, and and then there was the question how to how to drain how to excavate it in that way that we can also serve the the values for this natural area downstream and for the trout population. So in this case, a two-stage channel profile was tested, and the. You can see to the right picture on the flood season, 
the, the brook itself is left to the right, you know, the right side of the flood plain, and the flood can rise on on this flood terrace, that's, which is about four, five meters broad in this case. And here in the middle <coughs> pic picture, you can see how it was excavated, and the, the first, the original state was here to the left. Of course, it was rather natu nat nature like before and it was a pity to do anything for it, but something had to be done because of this drainage need. But it was possible to, to maintain the original uh, course of the small channel without touching it. So the, here are, are the benefits that were gained. So there was decreased channel erosion during the excavation, actually no turbidity or very little of turbidity was caused for the for the channel itself. And no more flood flooding for the fields and there was a developing of the bank vegetation and decreased channel erosion. And it was also noted noted that there was increased sedimentation of solid substances to the flood terrace in the, in the investigation that was done. And there was this improved water quality and ecological benefits because the low flow channel stayed as, as small and narrow as it was formerly also. And this serves also as as ecological corridor now, so it's in, increased by the by a by diversity on this agricultural area compared that there was only only the channel going between the the narrow channel going between the fields. The channel is now more stable, less maintenance is needed, and it's proved to be cost effective. So it was not more expensive to, to excavate it in, in that way. And we had the, got these ecological benefits. And it's now stated that after the excavation was done, I think it's five years ago now, after it, it was noted that there were this, uh, this brown trouts seen in the river section or brook section downstream. So <coughs> we really didn't cause any harm for the trout population. And there are further questions. There are comparison needed in different circumstances and also monitoring of fish and vegetation of flood terrace should be done and it, it is done also, it was done also in this research work out the university. And one question will be the maintenance of these two stage profiles because the vegetation is going to grow there, maybe bushes are coming there. And so the farmers also need some special methods for for keeping them open enough in future. And here are some references what we've done. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as you heard, I will give a presentation about how it's possible to bend rivers by mussels. No, I mean fresh water mussels, not those. Mm -hmm. And uh, the outline of this presentation will be that I will give you some basics about the project and the objectives. Uh, some of the results and achievements from one out of 12 uh, project sites, uh, the Philoan Creek, and I will also give you some uh, information about the work we've been doing with the thick shell river mussel, Unicrassus, and uh, I will end up the presentation uh, telling you why we're focusing on this mussel species and uh, also some conclusions. Here we can see the major tool, and here we can see the major target group for this uh, project which contains of five major components, uh, of which the restoration part is the most important one. We are doing scientifically um, approaching work when it comes to both monitoring the work and also uh, when it comes to uh, river restoration and, and stream ecology. Of course, we do a lot of monitoring and uh, also a lot of information and dissemination. We work at 12 sites uh, within this project and th those 12 sites are all located uh, alongside the historical distribution range of the Unio Crassus. 
And uh, what we're doing is, yeah, we work site specifically as in each of the site, uh, the project sites, the the disturbances are unique. So the meshes that we are doing are uh, unique as well. But in generally, uh, but in general, uh, we are working with habitat enhancements, uh, removing migration barriers, and we are reintroducing this rare mussel at places where it's become extinct. And we do a lot of information. It is a life project, uh, so much of the money is coming from the European Union. We have one very clear objective, and that is a healthier Baltic Sea by land-based measures. And more specifically, we are working with uh, water quality improvements in both those streams, but also uh, in the uh, Baltic Sea in the long run, including increased biodiversity. Uh, we aim for better knowledge when it comes to river restoration, and uh, by using that knowledge we can also get a better public understanding for what we're doing, and that's the main uh, thing here, that if people don't understand what we're doing, it's no, really no use to do it. So we want this project to function as a catalyst by using the Salt Baltic Sea as a platform. We have huge problems in the uh, Baltic Sea, as many of you know, we have huge problems with eutrophication, causing algal blooms and oxygen deprivation and more or less, yeah, around 15% of the Baltic Sea is more or less dead, leading to fish population collapses and loss of ecosystem services. On top of that, we have acidification problems, toxins, etc., etc. But most of the problems we face at sea are land-based, as in Philodolan Valley, which was drained during the 30s to gain <coughs> agriculture areas. We got changes in hydrology, faster discharge and dry floodplain conditions, with negative <coughs> impacts on the habitats and biodiversity and the water quality as a result, which in turn led to negative impact on the Baltic Sea as this river drains into the Baltic Sea. And that was really the, uh, the reason why we started up this project in the Philodolan Valley. And here you can see on your left-hand side the post-restoration condition, <laughs> and on your right-hand side we can see uh, post-restoration condition, conditions. And the objectives uh, with this uh, uh, work was were to recreate hydrology, habitats, and connecti connectivity. And the concrete ach achievement so far is that we've been able to re-meander five kilometers of the, the creek, and uh, the creek is today one kilometer longer today than it was uh, before uh, the restoration act actions uh, were carried out. We've also been able to rise the groundwater level uh, approximately 70 hectares. We have been able to restore wetlands and open up tributaries. Uh, and in addition, we have been able to recreate habitats suitable for junior crustaceans, and we have also been able to reintroduce this mussel species in that site. And that was not a very easy crack to uh, not to crack. Uh, we can see here in this illustration the on top uh, on, on the bottom here we can see the adult gravel female mussel which releases its uh, Glochidia larva, the baby mussels, during a summer time. And those small mussels or the Glochidias needs to find a host fish within a couple of days. And on the host fish they feed as a parasite uh, for a month or so. And after the, that month is done, they have been developed into more full grow or a, a juvenile mussel, and then they release as it, uh, itself from the mussel, uh, from the fish, and then drops to the the uh, 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 the bottom of the stream, where it migrates down into the gravel or the substrate, where it stays for a, a few years, uh, after which it migrates up again to the the surface of the bottom and starts field feed, feed feeding. The problem was we didn't really know what kind of host fish species the, the mussel required. And if those uh, fish species were river specific, meaning that the, some fish species might function differently in, in different rivers. Uh, today, after more than two years of studying these uh, um, uh, questions, we've been able to identify at least four fish species that the mussel uh, can use as host, and it's the um, stone loach, the three-spined stickleback, the minnow, 
the bleak, but also brown trout have been shown to function as a host fish in, in some of the waters we've been working at. So this is entirely new uh, information uh, in, for Scandinavian conditions. And uh, that means that we have been able to reintroduce more than 100,000 Glochidias by uh, just putting out infected host fish in the streams. But also been able to farm and introduce more than 8,000 juveniles into uh, those streams as well. And now uh, we are doing uh, some uh, monitoring, of course, but there are still so small still, so we don't really know the survival rates of the, the fish that we've been able to, to stop. But we should find a movie in somewhere. This is really nice music too. Here we have this little one. His name is Bob. He's two weeks old after being, you know, infested by the fish. So, so he's no longer a fish muscle. It's half a millimeter long. He uses his foot for feeding. So instead of a, a spoon or so, he uses the foot. And then he uh, eats dead organic matter. term objective is that we should have a reproductive unicrasis population in less than 10 years within this room and uh, it's quite promising because already one year after the restoration uh, was done we could find by um, our uh, fish sampling that uh, a number of fish species uh, had uh, recolonized the stream so we have today brown trout, minnow, three spines, stickleback, and bullhead, all of those potential host fish for the mussel in the stream. So the, the uh, ecology seems to respond really, really fast on this restoration, which is very promising indeed. So the reason we are focusing on, on, on this mussel species is that it is a flagship species, meaning that if, if the mussel is doing well, a lot of other species, also endangered ones, are doing well. And it's an indica indicator for a healthy environment. When we are communicating with the kids, it's always easy to say, like, if the muscle are doing well, we, w we do have clean water. And if we have clean water, we have healthy kids. And the kids like that kind of simplicity. And uh, so should we do. Uh, the muscle has had a huge historical distribution range that is today the most threatened mussel species in Europe. The mussel filters water up to 40 liters per day, thereby reducing nutrients. It's long-lived with a complex life cycle, as you heard, and it's a good pedagogue and a symbol of our work. And uh, this picture here on your right-hand side shows you the European Parliament member, Levine, topping mussels during the opening ceremony in the Philadelphia Valley this spring. So even politicians can speak mussels. <laughs> so, to conclude everything, uh, we believe that it's possible to bend rivers by muscle, and the work in Fulion Creek is promising and an interesting project to follow. And uh, the reintroduction of the muscle seems to work, and uh, we believe that this kind of approach is applicable in other areas, as we are doing the same thing, um, but in much larger scale in a, in a, in a river section close by. So, by that I would end this presentation and just showing you the muscles of the project. All those guys are working within this group here. And I would also like to just tell you that we are looking forward here now. So we are looking for a new uh, project starting 2017 focusing on river restoration and the Baltic Sea. If any one of you is interested in take part of this, please let me know. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, Alex and I aren't going to dance during our presentation. Just clear that up. Uh, sorry. How hurts? <laughs> unless, things, <laughs> unless things go really wrong, then we might do. Um, I should also say that we're talking on behalf of uh, Paul Quinn today, who's a, a senior lecturer at Newcastle University, who works with Alex and I quite a lot. Um, just a quick running order, we're going to talk about sustainable catchment management in general to put our work into context and then I'll introduce NFM and then the links to WFD and how NFM and WFD as movements are intrinsically linked together, how they have common goals. Um, then Alex is going to talk about his experience of implementing NFM at the catchment scale at Belford in Northumberland. We then do some conclusions and have a small, a small interactive workshop at the end. So this is a, a question which I'm sure many of you have asked yourselves before when you're restoring rivers, in that are you focusing on a, a symptom rather than a, uh, the problem itself, the cause itself? Um, rivers are commonly thought of as good barometers of, of catchment health in that if you have a, a bad quality river, it's more than often because it's symptomatic of a, a bad quality catchment. And most of the catchments that we work in have been heavily modified in the past and artificially influenced, which has increased the rates of runoff of water and, and sediment into, into rivers and streams, um, which means that they're more susceptible to, to low flows because there's less water being held up in the catchment and less recharge of aquifers, etc. And they're more likely to have extreme, uh, unnaturally high flood peaks as well. So. When we talk about restoring natural processes, it's often the case that we're not restoring natural processes because the actual hydrology in our catchments is unnatural. And that's where NFM can come in and help to almost re-naturalize that hydrology so that when you look at your river restoration projects, you've got a firm footing straight away. So, yeah, just some context on sustainable catchment management again. Um, again, working with natural processes, are we actually restoring natural processes when we restore our rivers. We need something else in the catchment to, to almost re-correct the problems with hydrology. Um, so when we can't restore catchment processes, then we'll try and mimic them. Um, and we can do that by implementing the various means of natural flood management or natural water retention, as it's been referred to a lot at this conference, uh, which Alex will talk about um, a bit later. And then by doing all that, we can really take advantage of nature in the catchment. We can take advantage of natural recovery and vegetative, vegetative development and become more resilient to, to floods and droughts and allow for geomorphological change and, and habitat maintenance. So these are many of the, the drivers that we'll all work on in various different ways to different degrees that help us to look towards sustainable catchment management or integrated catchment management. So there's river restoration, green infrastructure, suds, uh, ecosystems, all with the, their own terminologies and their own uh, frameworks and drivers, but ultimately they have many common goals a lot of the time. And increasingly, WFD and natural flood management play a significant role in, in sustainable catchment management. <coughs> so a quick introduction to NFM. Um, we've just very briefly defined it as alteration, restoration, or use of landscape features to reduce flood risk. Um, but as has been covered in other presentations at this conference, there's any number of other benefits that uh, NFM or natural water retention brings as well. And this is going to take a different scale of engineering to what society is used to really. We're going to have to look at the catchment and analyse the catchment in order to, to engineer it at the catchment scale, which sounds quite scary, but as Alex will show you, it can be, it can be done. And here are some means of, of NFM. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to this in detail, but basically anything to attenuate, slow, and store, and filter sediment as it, as it moves through uh, agricultural land. Um, just to drill down a little more into how WFD relates to NFM, um, most people who deal with WFD consider the catchment as a, as a water body rather than the river itself. And when it's mapped, you'll see water bodies mapped by, by catchment. And NFM, because it has these benefits in reducing um, low flows and reducing flood peaks, it almost re-naturalizes the hydromorphology. 
so it has that WFD benefit. And because it slows down water, it increases the residence time in catchments of, of water. It has natural water treatment benefits, and it filters out fine sediment, which both of those factors will improve ecology. And to be more specific, uh, it directly relates, NFM directly relates to WFD mitigation measures. So where we might introduce an NFM scheme to slow down um, flow by re-meandering or reconnecting old river bends, um, then we're going to have a WFD benefit. And where we might try to manage and slow down water by putting in buffer strips and managing land use, then again we're going to have a WFD benefit at the catchment scale. It also relates to, to altering the flow regime as a mitigation measure. Um, so NFM has specific benefits for, for the Water Framework Directive. Uh, as mentioned, it helps to naturalise the, the hydromorphology or the, the hydrology, which can then help to naturalise hydromorphology in, in restored rivers. It has that water quality benefit. So those particular two elements, hydromorphology and water quality, are, are covered quite nicely. So by slowing down water, increasing the vegetation and the surface area in NFM features, then you're going to get better quality water. And the things that are meant to be staying on, on farmers' fields, like very fertile fine sediment and uh, phosphates, nitrates, are staying there, not ending up in the, the river systems. And as an aside, you can help to manage your, your sediment uh, using NFM as well. And at that point, I'll pass you over to Alex to talk about his scheme at Belford. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to show you a few pictures from, uh, from my research catchment Belford uh, in Northumberland. It was a small catchment, uh, it was six square kilometres, and it had a flooding problem uh, downstream in the village. Uh, and all these pictures are, um, are demonstrating the, the problem that we saw at Belford, which was uh, overland flow. Uh, it was overland flow generated on, on agricultural land. The majority of the land leading up to the village uh, was farmland. And we're referring to this uh, throughout this presentation as a kind of artificial peak, because without the intensification to agriculture in this, in this catchment, and in lo a lot of catchments throughout the UK and Europe, uh, would there be this, this surcharge, this surplus overland flow. So I'm going to talk you through a few measures that we've installed uh, in order to target this, this runoff. And really, it's in an attempt to uh, impact those three uh, water framework directive elements, which is hydromorphology, water quality, and ecology. But primar primarily, this was a flooding-related uh, issue. So what did we do? This is the, this is the belt of catchment. Um, we installed 30 uh, what we call runoff attenuation features, but what everyone else has been calling natural water retention measures. Um, uh, and they were all designed to slow, store, and filter the, uh, the peak flow in the river and the overland flow um, that we were seeing on the steep topography. Um, and they all had a varying function. Some were purely designed to capture overland flow in the, uh, in the steep topography uh, and slow it down and allow it to drain uh, at, a, uh, at a much slower rate. Some, we might have large woody debris or, or features that would uh, emulate the function of large woody debris, um, designed to reduce conveyance and uh, cause, cause flooding of sacrificial areas, i.e. the riparian zone. So we talked about uh, reconnecting uh, large areas of riparian land in, in, on a much bigger scale, I'll add, um, but uh, on, in, in this catchment we did it here. And we also had on and, on on and offline runoff attenuation features which were directly adjacent to the river channel itself, and those are designed to capture the peak flow in the river and filter that flow. So what, what are they? Runoff attenuation features are uh, sim simply natural features designed to attenuate uh, and slow, store, and filter runoff. They're designed not to impact farming significantly. Um, they're typically small, they only be 500 cubic meters in size. Uh, but some can be much larger, uh, depending on opportunistic sites. And they are designed to provide multiple benefits, e.g. nutrient transport, sedimentation reduction, and uh, carbon sequestration and ecological benefits. So I'm going to show you a few pictures now of, of some of those features, um, and I probably could talk about them for another half an hour on each of the pictures, but because they are desperate to get that USB pen, I better, <laughs> I better get going. Is that right, Bruno? <laughs> we search for multiple benefits. <laughs> And because it's near the coffee break. Um, so this is a this is a feature in Belford which is designed to capture overland flow, 
and disconnect fast flow pathways. And the water, if I can figure out how this works, uh, the, the water is flowing uh, from this side of the picture over here, and then it drains through a small pipe uh, in the soil bund. And this soil bund was located using GIS analysis, um, and it's located up here on the map. Uh, and we use this to basically to d describe the describe where we were going to install things to the farmer. So the farmer um, would actually end up seeing uh, a Google Earth image um, where all this information was transposed. And when we showed him uh, this feature originally, uh, we wanted to put it here because it had a larger contributing area. Uh, but in this location is a is a is a gate um, giving him access to the field, and that would have blocked that access. So uh, he said, "Well, why don't you put it up here?" So we agreed and we did that. Uh, and there was another feature down here where we wanted it in the corner of a field. But as that would be using some of his uh, uh, productive area, uh, we decided to move it into the forest, into the riparian zone itself. And this feature uh, can store 500 cubic meters of water. And in addition, uh, one of the other benefits was that during a single storm event, it captured a ton of of sediment from that field. And it's not a very large contributing area, but we were finding that because a lot of these flood events were happening, this is a, a winter flood, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of rotation um, is happening in the winter now. We're having winter sown cereals, um, and we're getting a lot of runoff of uh, high quality sediment going downstream. It's better to keep that sediment on the farm, and it's better to keep it from entering the drainage systems uh, further downstream, because that will cause additional knock-on effects in the village. Uh, this feature is, was actually the first installed in the Belford catchment. Um, it is a leaky timber barrier. Uh, a lot of people refer to it as the whiskey barrel because it, it looks a bit like a whiskey barrel. Uh, but this was the first feature that we installed in the catchment uh, and it was really a demonstration feature. We, uh, we talked to the farmer and the analysis tool said that this is where water would collect and this is where we um, uh, would be a highly beneficial place to put it. Uh, and the farmer disagreed, but we built it anyway, and a, and a week later, uh, it filled up with water, and he said, right, crack on, uh, get on with the rest of the work. Um, it's built with wood because of the shallow soils in the catchment, um, uh, this part of the catchment, and he didn't want us to use a big soil bund um, degrading all his soil. So it takes a very, very little space when it's empty. And all these features in Belford are designed to uh, fill, well, be empty within 12 hours of being full, so that they're ready for the next storm event. And here's that, um, the leaky structure demonstrated in this photo. The large woody debris is fairly self-explanatory, but we um, pr uh, add a word of caution on large woody debris. You only use it if you're crossing the river. Uh, these, we, these large sycamore trees were all the way across the river. And if you're going to do that, use that at the appropriate scale. So we decided a maximum scale of three square kilometers, or depending on velocities, if it's a steeper catchment, um, measure the velocities and, and become a judge uh, for the urine catchment. Uh, we also um, put these brash filters uh, across the riparian sacrificial floodplain uh, to ensure that any material carried by the water uh, was, uh, was dropped out on the, on the floodplain. This is an offline uh, pond. Uh, so the, the river uh, sort of runs past and around the, the outside of this, of this soil bund. And it's not a huge floodplain, it's, uh, it's, it's about 500 square metres. Um, so by building a metre high uh, soil bund at the back of it, um, allowed us to maximise the floodplain storage available in this location. So once the river level gets to a certain height, it is able to spill into the, uh, the pond itself uh, and slow down, and then it's, it drains again through an outlet pipe at the back of the feature. And again, has multiple benefits of storing um, uh, sediment contained in the in the, um, in the river itself. And here's just an idea of uh, where those features were placed in the Belford catchment. And I'll, um, I'll, if anyone's really interested in that, I'll show them a bit later, because uh, just in the interest of time. And these features weren't expensive to uh, construct. Um, typically, they'd cost between one and five thousand um, pounds. Uh, the soil buns were the cheapest and then uh, some of the op more opportunistic, um, uh, innovative structures like the timber um, would cost a lot more. Uh, but we estimated that uh, the construction cost of 8,000 cubic metres of water um, uh, could, could be done for 7,000 uh, 7, pounds. 
and it gave us an idea of where to install features within a catchment if you were going to do it again. Uh, and this is obviously is a very small scale in comparison with some of the things we've seen at this conference, but I just wanted to highlight that these, these headwater catchments, these flashy catchments, are in existence in all our big catchments. Uh, and just areas like this can be targeted throughout, um, throughout large catchments. Get the right feature in the right place. Uh, and I'll just skip through this very quickly, but this was just a, a, a tool that we created to uh, demonstrate the effect. Following some measurements, uh, we created a tool to emulate the, the function of those, um, of those ponds. And we were able to show that by adding more and more runoff attenuation features to a network, we could impact the hydrograph uh, that was uh, seen at the Belford Village. Uh, and we could have, with 30 runoff attenuation features, uh, we could have a 30% reduction of discharge if they were all created in a certain way and targeted flood peak in a certain way. So I'll pass over to David to quickly summarise uh, and introduce our um, workshop to be done during the coffee break, probably. Okay, I'm um, yet yeah, to, to conclude. Um, NFM is found to be a sustainable way of managing runoff, has low cost and offers multiple benefits, just as an idea of how much lower the cost is. A standard flood alleviation scheme would have been an order of magnitude above what was, what was paid um, in, the, in the instance of Belford. Uh, this connection of runoff pathways to source produces flood peaks locally and captures sediment, um, and, but maintenance is needed long term, but that can often be to the benefit of the farmer who gets to keep his topsoil. And it's the network of runoff attenuation features that's important, in that if you get them in the wrong place, in the wrong sub, the wrong sub catchment, they can actually increase flood risk in certain instances by delaying the peak so that it meets another peak. Um, the intrinsic WFD benefits of NFM on all three WFD ele elements, but more research is needed in general to, to quantify these benefits. And there's good, that takes some risk adversity and a bit of a, a leap of faith. And that takes us to the workshop, uh, which is why I want to be doing more NFM. Do we do this now or is it uh, after the coffee break? Let's ask the attendees. Uh, would you be tough enough to invest the coffee break time in the workshop or should we uh, risk to be late afterwards? So, but we can't be late and more late than five, five minutes yeah, to stop. We okay, so, so we have a directive, okay. <laughs> we do it now. I mean, we really should be, all of us, or we should just uh, quarter to seven in the current place. So okay. But we time. can uh, take some... Uh, water or drinks. Yes, yeah. during the, yeah, exactly, yeah, this yeah. is the, 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 the best Bring idea. Drink the coffee here. Yeah, 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 okay, okay, perfect. So we go on with your workshop. Okay, great. Perfect, this is right, right for you. <laughs> um, yeah, basically we want to build up a picture as to why we aren't doing more natural yes. flood management across, across Europe and, and the rest of the world, in fact. Um, so it would be good if every person could take 10 coloured dots, which Alex will have, and on the uh, flip chart sheets, we've listed uh, potential barriers to NFM. So just very basic reasons as to why NFM is not happening in your particular country. And I'd like you to take the coloured dots and stick them on the barriers that you think are the most important to, to the place where you're from. Um, and then if you, you can put more than one dot against one particular barrier. And if you do that and you have a cluster, it would be good if you could draw a circle around them with a pen and then write which country uh, that represents next to the, the cluster of dots. And that will just help us to build a picture of what the feel is across Europe as to why NFM is not happening and come up with some solutions as to how we can get over these, these barriers in general. And we also have a different colour set of dots for people that live outside of Europe just so we can keep track of where these uh, issues are globally. And then afterwards, we'll summarize all the results and uh, we'll circulate them afterwards. But I think in amongst all that, if anyone has any ideas of how we can get past these barriers, then there's also a solutions and initiatives sheet that you can stick uh, post-it notes onto. Um, and that'll just form part of the overall picture. Okay. I, I would say perfect. Okay, good. So, and also for the commitment and also for the will to organize a part of the interactive uh, session. I would like to give you oh, both uh, my de our dedication uh, yeah. for your presentation. Sorry about this. <laughs>